welcome to the Delling Pod with my special guest. I've been so looking forward to meeting him and talking to him about his amazing book. His name is Ben Cobley and he's written a book called The Tribe, which I think everyone, everyone who listens to this podcast certainly should read because it's a really, really great book book i read it on holiday recently in morocco I, I gave myself a little a little a little chunk to read each day because because you, you can't read it like a beach novel it's quite it's quite a serious academic tome wouldn't you say ben in a, in a way um in a way i guess thank you yeah yep that thank you yeah. my flat white's arrived like well? yes yeah. thank That's you right, yeah. um yeah it's not a beach read is what i'm saying yes i mean it's I, d- I didn't write it to be an academic book. I did write it to be as accessible to to basically anyone and everyone as possible. Um, but obviously, I mean, it, it does employ quite a lot of ideas, a bit of philosophy in there. Um, but I do my best, uh, struggle away to try and explain it as you know, straightforward a manner as possible. Um, and I mean, so far from the readers, quite a wide range of readers has been quite a good response, even from people who are not norm- normally readers have got through it. So, uh, I tell you, I, I have probably not since my university days have I read a book where I've underlined so many sentences. It's, it's, I, I, think it, I think it's a really important book, and I, I think it deserves much wider coverage. And I, I, so maybe you can tell me, first of all, why it's called The Tribe. Who are The Tribe? Well, The Tribe, I guess it... Um, it comes from a like you know just the basic idea of of different groups obviously and um, but a tribe is a, is a bit stronger than that um, it's a group which has uh, certain taboos certain ways of ways of doing things of relating to each other which are obviously different to to other people and I thought I mean that the full title of the book is the tribe the liberal left and the system of diversity so the tribe is the liberal left or in its full nomenclature the progressive liberal left right um so i think we all basically know who these people are i kind of come from this this tribe myself um, that's what that's one of the things that's interesting about about you isn't it that that you're not like me you're not a natural conservative and you went to cambridge and by the way i i think it is quite a cambridge book i think why would you say that then? well i think an oxford book would be if one wanted to make crass generalizations would be the kind of thing that Better. i would no 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 different it would be it would be less grown up um more flippant more polemical whereas what you've done is very very patiently analyzed what i think is one of the most terrifying phenomena of our times which is the way that the the language human behavior everything from jokes to how you can behave with the opposite sex or people of different races has been taken over by this what you call the tribe who have imposed these rules on us what you're allowed to say what you're not allowed to say what you're allowed to do what you're not allowed to do and your book is a very good explainer of the intellectual undercurrents which which have created this situation yeah i I don't know if i would actually agree with that Great. On the intellectual undercurrents, because that's something I, I actually think I tried to avoid doing, was like explaining how it came about, like who's to blame, who are the theorists who sort of are responsible for this sort of stuff. I rather tried to explain it as this is what's going on now, and this is how it works. So I mean, obviously there, are, there are intellectual aspects to it, but I'm not, I'm not um, critiquing like intellectuals themselves. It's more everyday politicians who not many of them we would probably define as intellectuals and just everyday activists well funny when you mention people who aren't intellectuals i instantly thought of david lammy david (laughs) david lammy the 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 race baiting labor mp i mean tell me labor were presumably once your natural party well i i was once um when uh, uh labor was holding its internal selection for the london mayor candidate david lammy was my man I, w- I was going to vote for him. Was he? Um, I think I may have actually voted for him um, because you know he has a, a great lot of qualities. He uh, around the London riots time he wrote a book about that, which was quite full on and and you know took on a lot of the the sort of groupthink. So 
you know, his vault fast, especially with Brexit, has been quite astonishing, quite interesting, and you know, from my perspective, obviously disappointing. Because yes. I, you know, I, I, I think he, he has a lot of genuine qualities. Look, I think of I think of David Lammy as the kind of person I would like to have on my team because yeah, he's, 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 a, he's a fighter. Yeah, he's, he's a fighter. feisty. Yeah, no, he's, he seems to be quite charismatic. I mean, I can't stand him. I, I, I think what he's doing with his politics is ugly and cynical and divisive and race-baiting. But he's, he plays a good game. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm searching your book to try and find the... The David Lammy. Well, there's. Uh, it's quite uh, early on, isn't it? Sort of page maybe eight, even if oh, that's right. six okay. or eight. Okay. Of the introduction, he appears. I think. Okay. Talking so, about Grenfell Tower. Yes, we, that was an interesting example of, of of the problem you're you're describing. That Grenfell Tower, which should have been a, a tragedy in which we could all feel sorry for the victims and so on suddenly became a, a, a stick with which to beat a certain type of person, didn't it? I mean, white people... For well, one. it became really politicised in that way, um, over race especially. Um, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, targeting white people. Obviously, there was a bit going the other way as well, from traditional, like, racialists, sort of, you know, looking at all the people in the tower, most of whom were immigrants and weren't white, and, you know, attacking on that basis. But... From what I observed, it was very much the progressive, um, liberal left-led and activist-led um, response and attack at uh, you know in institutional white culture as being to blame for it was first and was a lot stronger. And, and a lot of that old racialist reaction was partly in response to that, I think. Well, indeed, I, I suppose what, when, I, when I talk about it being divisive, it's exactly that. When you get... If you really want to, I don't think there is much race, actual racism in this country. But if you really want to to bring it out from under the under the floorboards, what you do is do what David Lammy does, Absolutely. and really yeah. start goading people yeah. and start and start implying that. Well, one of the extraordinary things I thought about the the Grenfell Tower business was when activists like David Lammy started demanding that only a a black judge or a, a, a yes, that's an right. He, he, he be said, he said uh, on the long on the lines of um, it's got to be someone who's black. You know, I think he has, has an immigrant background. Or also, he said, which was I found quite interesting. I I wrote this in the book. He said it should be a woman, as well. You know, either or. And, 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 how, this, and how does that work? Is and that this and this fits into, you know, the schema that I put into my book. Um, which is where the liberal left, progressive liberal left, politicises various different identity groups and, and basically favours them. You know, it's, a, it's, it's politics, it's very simple, yeah. you know, um, and that's why this sort of politics is so effective, because it's so simple. You don't have to think very much about it. We all know what you do. You favour certain groups. Yeah. So for him, on Grenfell Tower, when he's saying who the judge should be, it shouldn't be another old white man of the establishment. Yeah. Um, he didn't just say, oh, maybe it should be a non-white person or immigrant background. He said woman as well. Um, so that's bringing in the whole, almost the whole sort of favoured group side of the liberal left. Um, you know, to, I, th I guess you could say mobilising it. Yes, yes. I was thinking about this, that, that what is it that, okay, David Lammy, I, I, I'm not sure how clever he is. He, he he got in. He got into Harvard Law School. I think he's probably quite thick. I mean, I, you know, the fact that it, Diane Abbott got into Cambridge isn't necessarily an indicator of, of great intellect. She just may have played the system. But I but, couldn't possibly comment. No, <laughs> you couldn't. But but taking a step back, why why would somebody like David Lammy or indeed John Snow would be another example, the Channel Four News presenter? Why would they? Why would they? adopt these positions which do not stand up to serious critical analysis i mean there's there's no objective reason why if the law is functioning a white judge should perform any worse a job a white male judge perform any worse a job than a, a black female judge i mean that's i mean i mean by definition of what justice is it's practicing justice yes that's what it's for it's not to practice racial favoritism so you, mm. you really don't need to have gone to cambridge to understand this everyone understands that 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 justice is well i think blind. that's maybe a point that actually 
that that's kind of got lost. You know, the basic ideas of what our institutions should be for. Yes. That the police should be to, you know, to stop crime and the justice system is there to, you know, prosecute crime and maybe you could say prevent crime possibly as well. Those sorts of ideas, you know, you think about the media as well, that it's, it's there to maybe to tell the truth, tell us what's going on. I think those meanings have, have really got diluted and lost in the sort of world that I'm talking about in the book. It's very interesting you say that. I, I don't... You've, you've actually taken me... Also, of course, sorry, um, yeah, media, you know, for example, you know, to entertain as well. You know, those, are, those, those aims have become subjected to other political... Um, you know, ben, I think yeah. possibly Comedy you too. and I, you and I, could actually become become lovers because because I think we have a. I don't think so. You know, we've developed a bond there that you, you were actually thinking ahead of where I was going to go anyway, which was I don't know whether you u- actually use the phrase first principles or not, but no, I d- no, but I don't but know. it seems to me that yeah. one of the things our culture has lost is to think through everything from from first principles. For example, time was the job of the police was to keep law and order with 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 consent of the the people who for whom they administered justice uh the job of the entertainment industry was to entertain there's there's a very good section in your book on on the on the bbc's new b a m e policy their diversity policy oh is that actually channel 4 uh, well, Channel Maybe. 4, I think, operates uh, something, yeah, both, operate yeah. something similar. Yeah. They've both got these diversity and sexuality and gender targets uh, of the kind of people they want working in their organisation by 2020, I think it is. And it's, it's a quota system. And you make the point in the book, very sensibly, that here is an institution which was originally designed for entertainment and uh, whatever the the Rethian principles were that uh, are now edu- educate inform yeah. Inter- yeah. Something like that, yeah but now it's become about something else it's become another branch of the yes. diversity industry now I think this should have more scrutiny than it's than it's really had absolutely I, c- I completely agree and I I think they're they're sleepwalking into it they don't really quite realize what they're doing or that, you know, maybe you could say, use, use the phrase cognitive dissonance. They still think they're doing all, all what they did before. And what they're doing now in, in bringing in all these quotas and, and also, um, you know, prior, different priorities of what they should be covering. They don't realise that, that those, those two, you could say, sort of aims of the organisation are sometimes in conflict. You know, I think if, if your aim is to, is to represent... It's not necessary to tell the truth, for instance, or, or to tell the whole truth. You see, I think the BBC knows exactly what it's doing, uh, in as much as I think the, the BBC has become so, to use Vox Day's phrase, so SJW converged, that actually the people in the organisation, the, the parasites have taken over. Uh, they've taken over the host, and they, they very much are in the business of, of enforcing the woke agenda and using in, in Gramscian style using the institutions to to impose their left liberal hegemony over over the country but I but I mean just briefly that that is an area where we do slightly differ right. definitely in that I do tend to see that it's it's not less not not nearly with a lot of people nearly as conscious of that in that a lot of people you might see doing that will have never have heard of Gramsci, for instance. But you, d- you, only need a, you only need a small number of people to, to enforce that ideology and everyone else goes along to get along. Yes, once you manage to enforce the rules and get these things institutionalised, then, I mean, we all, you know, if we're going to stay employed, we have to abide by the rules and, and reproduce them, yeah. Well, you've said in the book one of the things that's, that's so dangerous about the, tri- the tribe or why it's so successful is that you don't need to opt in yeah, that's crucial. Yeah, it's a default setting now for us all in public life. Yeah, that 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 you, you see MPs doing it a lot. Even Conservative MPs, they will always deplore any any manner of uh, any lapse in the in the rules of identity politics, don't they? I'm trying to think. Of, I'm trying to think of some examples. Um, but you see, Conservative, particularly Conservative female MPs, are uh, very keen to show how 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 on board with feminism they are. Yes, yes. And we've seen um, Theresa May has 
allied up with the Fawcett Society as well, which is, you know, it's a political the feminist organisation which tells basic, I wouldn't say lies, but, you know, you know, is dishonest, for example, about the, the gender pay gap, you know, tells half-truths about it. You're talking about the power of slogans in, in the book, the, the power, or, or rather, the forcefulness of theory. Um, and how effective it is that that organisations like the the Fawcett Society are uh, in in getting the, the the culture to accept their theory as fact. For example, I, I hear people like my daughter tell me that um, uh, if you believe in equality, you, you're a feminist, and and that's a given. And, yes, and I think yeah. that the, I think the Fawcett Society has promoted that notion that everyone's a feminist if you believe in equality. It's, it's only kind of evil chauvinists who don't believe in in. Yes, I mean they they've said that yes that um, even though a survey that they commissioned showed that not many women thought of themselves as feminist or or liked it, they said even even despite that, or even because of it, they actually are feminists because they believe in equality. Um, yes. They've, they've, so they've they, they, they twisted, yeah, they, and, and you see a lot of that type of rigging going on, you know, uh, and I, I link it a lot to the sort of the progressive idea that, you know, history is just moving in a certain way. Mm. So it has to be the way we're going because we're progressive, we're on the right side of history. Yeah. So therefore, you know, it's like with Brexit, it just can't happen. Yeah. Brexit can't happen because history is not going in the way of Brexit. Are you familiar with a book by Christopher Booker called The Neophiliacs? I'm afraid not. Okay, so in 1969, it's, it's actually the 50th anniversary, the, the, the mighty Christopher Booker, who, as you know, was a, was a founder of the... Um, you know, he, was a, he was the founding editor of Private Eye. He was very much involved in the 60s satire boom. But by 1969, he was starting to get a bit... Jaded is probably the wrong word. He was he he he'd seen he'd seen the truth about what was happening in 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 Britain, and he didn't like it. And the reason that he didn't like it was actually because of something rather similar to what you analyse in your book. This obsession with the new, with with the new automatically trumps the old. Everything the old, everything traditional mm. is bad. Mm. Everything new is good. It's progress, and progress must yes of itself be a, be a good thing. Yes. In the same way, one of the, the big things you see at the moment is this being promoted by Remainers in the Brexit debate, is this idea that immigrants, they're great, they're so much more um, productive and, and vibrant than, than the stale, pasty, white, disgustingly white workers that... that, that yes, the so there's, some, there's something that, uh, I mean, at least in this country, and, and I, I do, in the book, I just talk about Britain, I narrow my sights to Britain. Um, but I think uh, this stuff, it, it's relevant, obviously, to America. Happens in America The Anglosphere, well. and the rest of Europe, to yeah. an extent, yeah. um, some places more than others. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely. So, well, it's quite interesting that, that you particularly are making this point, because I, I, I can see that in a parallel universe, you, Ben Cobley, lefty Cambridge graduate are actually one of those those white people who endorses this idea oh, of yeah, white privilege. No, I, I, I forgot what I was going to say oh, there, yeah. which Tell was, um, of course, sorry to interrupt, um, it was that there's a sort of a vibe, at least in this country, that English people especially, British people to an extent, but it's more narrowed down on English you see yeah. in a lot of the discourse, is as a sort of diseased identity. Yeah. And you know, and they and they use Brexit very much as an example of that. They'll never mention that Wales was majority Brexit either. Um, so it was narrows down on the English, and that's that kind of tends to align with the whole progressive ethos um, of you know getting rid of uh, regressive identities and anything that's sort of associated with empire, um, which you might think actually Britain might might be more relevant to that but they know they've narrowed down on England because uh, I mean you have I guess the Scotland Scots you know nationalists at least they consider themselves sort of victimized by the English and the Irish obviously as well but they can somehow get away with that nationalism with that woad painted yes um, it's, Mel it's Gibson a progressive nationalism. sort of nationalism yeah. yeah while English is is seen as regressive yeah something that needs to be eliminated but this is all about branding isn't it it's 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 about the way that 
the way that the the progressives have very successfully promulgated this this narrative where to be English and working class particularly is something to be ashamed of and you, you saw a classic example of that with Lady Nugie what's that what's her name the the, the, the Labour... Uh, Emily, Emily, Emily Thornbury took a photograph of a house with a white van outside and some, some uh, English... Cross, it, was a cross, big, it was a big English flag in his, in his window, yeah, I think. Yeah, Cross of St George. Yeah. And she tweeted something sneering about this. And this is the, the contempt of the, of the liberal elite, the, the Remainer class particularly, for ordinary working people. And you and I are both champions of these ordinary working people, whether they like it or not. Yes, I mean, um, with that, it was... I, I seem to recall, I don't recall exactly what she tweeted. She may, she may have barely said a comment. It was... No, it was I think it was, it was a, just... It, it spoke for itself. It was a dog and whistle. And we, we could all just understand immediately what it meant. Yeah. It, it just summed up so much. Um, but this, this happens a lot. And I think... Look, I think a lot of people... Which, going back to why I think people should read your book, there are a lot of people like like us who are mystified and gobsmacked by this, by what's happened in the world. It's, things have happened very, very quickly. Things have changed very, very quickly. Indeed, let me get. I, I love doing digressions on this podcast, and let me give you a brief digression. I had never seen the film Sliding Doors. You know the one, Sliding yeah, Doors. I don't think I've seen it. Where, yeah. This was this was from a period where Gwyneth Paltrow was yes. not was not annoying. Um, yes. She was actually quite fanciful. It, it was uh, and it, so we we're talking quite a long time ago. 1998, the film was made, and and it starts off. Gwyneth Paltrow works for a PR agency in London, and on, uh, in the early stages of the film, she gets sacked from her job, and there are these males gathered round the table making sexist remarks and they sack her for some trivial offence. I, I think she's, she's borrowed some of their company vodka for a party and, and this is considered a, a, a sackable offence. And I was thinking, this film could never be made now because no one would believe the premise of, of, of a female being so easily sacked and of men sitting around a table being able to make sexist remarks. Now, I'm not saying that, that we should go back to a world where men could be, you know, a pre-Me Too world where Harvey Weinstein could molest whatever actress he wanted because that's the casting couch and that's how it goes. Nevertheless, the world has tr changed, I think, more dramatically probably culturally in the last 10 or 15 years than probably it's ever, ever changed at any time in history. But it's, I, I, it's certainly a remarkable time that we're going through. Yes, remarkable, and, crazy. And... The whole of our politics is just struggling to to keep up at all. Um, Indeed. In fact, it's yeah, it's just being sort of gathered up and sort of snowballed ahead. Yeah. You know, no one's in control. It's like I would say as a lefty, it's like it's like capitalism. You know, a runaway train. That's what um, identity politics and everything surrounding it is at the moment. Yeah. So there was another example I was thinking of more recently than the David Lammy. Uh, Grenfell Tower one, which was this happened last week or the week before. Jon Snow, Channel Four news presenter, looking at the crowd who'd gathered at the Brexit betrayal rally outside Westminster, and and saying in in shocked tones on on I mean he was genuinely appalled, wasn't he? When he put, he said, "I don't think I've ever seen so a crowd which is quite so white or so many white." It people. was a fascinating comment. That yes. Yeah. Do, but now, now, because tell me, tell me why it's because why it's because yeah, I mean we could all see the basic hypocrisy in the comment, but there was some sort of other un underlying truth yeah. to what he was saying, but it didn't come out in his words. So I mean we could see on social media, you know, so many people were pointing out that actually, you know, the Remainers march was virtually all white people. Um, Glastonbury, where he went and notoriously uh, shouted, saying, fuck the Tories, yeah. was, you know, very, very white. Um, and various other things as well. I mean, you know, Jon Snow will know these people, that a lot of these people are, you know, who he hangs out with. Yeah. Um, a lot of white people. So he wasn't actually shocked at white people all being gathered together in the place. But he was, he was insinuating something else. 
Well, for one thing, he was he was laying it down that these white people were negative white people. Yeah. They were the wrong white people. He would. He was signalling to the group, wasn't he? He was signalling to the tribe yes, that yeah. even though I, Jon Snow, am a middle-aged white person and therefore not technically, or not immediately eligible to to high status within the within the tribe because of my white privilege, nevertheless, I am acceptable because I am displaying my knowledge of my white privilege and being embarrassed by it, and therefore I'm okay. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily go that far into talk about privilege. I mean, it's kind of implicit there. I mean, I, I would say in the terms of my book that I, I talk about, you know, the likes of Jon Snow being a sort of overseeing class. Yes. That's the, that's the stance they're taking. And this is the liberal left I talk about in the book. Yeah. They kind of oversee society yeah. and they hand out favour, you know, informally in, in terms of that kind of comment, uh, along with disfavour, of course, to the, to the unfavoured groups, you know, by white people, um, and this is this is kind of the way it works. Um, but yeah, it was it was a mighty uh, hypocrisy, in a sense. But like I say, sort of really revealing in in terms of that truth, in that sort of the, the white people who would turn out for the pro Remain march would be the right white people because and it and it links in very much into immigration, um, you know, because Remain is is the pro immigration side or meant to be and then Brexit is meant to be the anti-immigration side. So in that sense, the pro-immigration side is, is on the, fav you know, is favouring a favoured group, which is immigrants, not uh, often uh, non-white people, non-English non people, that type of thing. Yes. So that's the alignment going on. Sorry, I'm, I'm probably waffling no, 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 and getting no, very no. dull here, I but that's, that's kind of how it works. Hmm. Yeah. It's, um, now I've forgotten what I was going to say, because um, there's, there's so much to talk about. Um, I mean, I mean that's what, just one thing with, with the book. Briefly, I mean, I I wrote it and I I tried, you know, not to overplay it in the book, but even then, you know, I I realised I've realised since I finished it that really it's a lot bigger. It's so big, the stuff that we're talking about. It kind of it's it's winding its way into sort of every sort of corner of our culture. Into I mean, you say about culture. your daughter, yes, talking to you at home. Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. This stuff. Totally. Yeah, girls, girls. It's not as though they're not into into. That they're not suborned by, by peer pressure anyway. And so, if these ideas are current, these 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 intellectual memes going round, where of course you're a feminist because if you believe in equality, everyone believes in it. It's and, it and also, of course, we got very young children now coming out and telling their parents they're gay, when they have no idea of even what sexuality is. Well, because there's power in being gay. I mean, it's it's not as good as being black, and it's not you know in in the in the uh, oppression Olympics, gay is now pretty far down the scale. But it's a, it's quite a sensible career move for a white male. It's the, about the best. I mean, the best one, obviously, getting a, getting a sex change. But but I mean, it, it has come to the st stage now. You know, when when people are applying for jobs, yeah. where you th where you have to tick all the boxes of what you are. You're thinking, actually, well, why don't I tick this box, which I'm not, you know, to, to maybe give me a, a bit of a leg up. Yeah. You know, do, do you think it's, it's so much a part of, of, uh, of employment now, of, like we're saying, sort of every single area of our culture and, and everything. Yes. Do you think I might get more podcast fans if, it, if, I, if, it, if this was the, the transgender Delling pod? Or the, the you, you could have a go. I could have a go, Especially yeah. Especially if you dressed up. I could do that. I could do that. Um, did you have a, a, a sort of road to Tarsus moment where you, you, you transformed it from... Was, it was a steady thing. I mean, I've always been a bit of a, a bit of a sort of contrarian, a bit of a rebel, you know, like to think that I think for myself. So, you know, since I remember since I was very young, I've been a bit like that. Um, but... Um, but I mean, certainly, I mean, what happened with me is I, in 2010, when Labour finally lost an election. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, the left's in a mess. I've been sitting in pubs, whinging about the left for God knows how many years. Surely, why, you know, why don't I sort of get my hands dirty and get in there and sort of see what's going on? You know, maybe do something. I yeah. don't know. So 
I joined the Labour Party, um, which I left in 2016 during the during the referendum campaign. Finally, had enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was eye-opening being in Labour, and I loved it in a lot of ways. It was it was terrific, you know, being being a member of a local party and you know having that route into your local community. But from the beginning, I start you know start to see this remarkable stuff. Like one of the first meetings I went to. Um, a colleague, you know, a quite a senior colleague in the local party, wonderful person, love her dearly, and she said we were talking about immigration. I, you know, I raised it, I think as a as a topic to talk about, and she said, um, yes, we should we should be in favour of immigration because immigrants vote Labour. And oh, she said that. So it was, it was just sort of, it's like zing. There, there you go. Um, but also you could see all sorts of, you know, fe- how strong feminism was. It was kind of it was awesome, and I. And I, uh, Can you remember any, any moments that were particularly where you felt like an inferior species? Well, there was one, I, I, I don't quite remember exactly how it happened, so I might sort of garble this or not explain it right. Yeah. Um, but it was going down the pub after a meeting yeah. afterwards, and I, I was hanging out with the younger people and you know, having a nice time, but I thought, you know, should, should get to know some of the other people as well. So I went up to two older ladies who were standing at the bar, and I, I said to them, I can't remember if I said, hello, ladies, or hello, girls. You didn't say, oi, 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 hello, darling. I didn't quite say that, <laughs> but they got very offended. Did they? At me saying, like, hello, hello, girls, or hello, hello girls. ladies. And then I tried the other one. I sort of, you know, if I said, hello, girls, I went, hello, ladies, and that didn't go down well at all. Isn't, and, then isn't I, and, then, and then I was just stumped. I went, well, what do I say? Because I don't know your names yet. Um, and they got very offended. But of course, I mean, I tried to sort of just play it down and all that. And, and we ended up sort of talking, you know, quite, quite nicely, sort of sharing a cigarette outside later. And it was just that strange sort of double life thing where they were genuinely offended. But if you are genuinely offended, surely you would actually genuinely hate me. Yes. But of course, it's ridiculous to, to do that on the basis of some just throwaway comment like that. Um, and... I mean that was kind of indicative, but uh, I, I, there was a, there was another moment as well, which was um, when they held, held a, a selection for a, um, a London Assembly candidate for the local London Assembly yep. candidate, and it was given an all women shortlist. So we were given a shortlist of women to vote for, yep. and then two turned up to speak to us locally, and one was dreadful, the other was kind of okay. Yeah. Um, so the one that was okay won. And she was the candidate last time, and she was also the candidate the next time after she had lost this time. And it was just like, well, hang on, you know, sort of, what is going on here? This is, this is kind of fixing, this is fixing selection processes so certain people get in. Yeah. And it's using, um, you know, the the all in shortlist to do that. So you could see how it's how it's working its way into the 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 institution of the Labour Party and kind of and moulding it to keep out sort of outsiders. Yeah. So I, 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 I saw this type of thing going on and I, I started writing about it. And luckily, you know, a Labour blog would publish some of my articles for a while. For a you know, while. And I've been quite critical about this. Um, but yeah, obviously as time went on, it was like, hang on, I'm getting more and more uh, uncomfortable with this stuff and genuinely don't think it's, it's all good. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically my, Did, my sort of journey. In your in your political phase, when you were a member of the party, do you think you would have broken bread with somebody like me? Would I, would you have been suspicious of me? I've always been, you know, like I say, a bit rebellious and a bit contrarian. So I so I probably would, but I would have been wary. Yeah, definitely. Breaking bread, I wouldn't have voluntarily. Yeah. Come and spoken to you. Um, but you know, I've I've never been I've never been someone that's completely sort of uh, how do you say sort of no platformed or sort of no, you're, how do you say sort quite, of completely excluded. You're quite you're you quite know. below the below the radar, and that's probably where you'd prefer to be, given the, the amount of shit that one gets if one puts one's head above the parapet. I mean, try being me, or or, or Claire Fox, or or Brendan O'Neill. It's absolutely yeah. I mean, I, I've experienced a bit in the past. Yeah. And it and it's really genuinely harrowing, and, what, you, and what you was feel it, what was it over? It was over well several things. But the the biggest one was over. I used the word um, 
well, I criticise the use of the word patriarchy in a few blog posts. So some of the feminists got on to me and they and they really came after me. You know, on, this was on social media on Twitter, yeah. and one of them, who I later found out was only 16 year old, an activist, uh, said that she wanted to throw a knife in my face. Yes. And you know that this is not completely serious. And to be I, fair, you know, she's I a girl, never, so she wouldn't have thrown very well. Well, you could say that. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> but, yeah, indeed. Uh, but Sorry. I mean, I, I genuinely found it quite, you know, Horrible. Quite har- harrowing, disturbing, and, and threatening. Um, I would never have sort of. I, ben, I never even knew of hate crime at that this, time. This language, I would never have done that. I don't see people on my side of the argument using it. I, I, I would. Oh, okay, I, I, so I got in trouble this morning for a. <laughs> I woke up this morning to find I'd been temporarily suspended from, from Twitter for a, a tweet from 2016. Somebody's, somebody had been engaged in offence archaeology and they'd gone through my old tweets looking for things that they could report me for. And there was one that said... Um, God, they must be employed to do that. I mean, that must how, take... How, how long must it take? That must take, like, um, days to do. Uh, go back to that. It was something like, um, uh, look, we may as well finally admit it, we've got to kill all the young people. Um, and... I, I think even a, even a sort of nanosecond analysis would, would, would have told anyone with any brains that this was not a serious tweet and that, that actually, I, I, having, having children of my own, I, I, I don't want to kill all, all, all young people. But nevertheless, Twitter solemnly issued the, 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 the order that I, that I could not carry on until I deleted the tweet, which, it, which I did. Um, but I don't see people on my side promoting violence I mean the, you asked me on the way here what was the tweet that got me into trouble I tweeted something disparaging and snarky about in relation to the to the, the paratroopers sh- shooting wax balls at a, at a target of Jeremy Corbyn and I, and I said something something flip like yeah well don't you think it's a good idea for the armed forces to be training against um, anti-semitic uh, communist um, terrorist supporting revolutionaries it didn't even occur to me that 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 that, that this is going to get into trouble. I just thought it would get a few a few likes from 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 the home the home crowd, and instead I found myself being reported. I had George Galloway reporting me to the Met Police, the Metropolitan Police, for inciting violence against. Uh, mm. you, and you're, and you're, you're thinking what? And loads and loads of momentum types have been joining in joining in Galloway to report me to the to the police, and I'm thinking. If, if we're entering an age where people cannot differentiate between genuine threats of violence and genuine endorsement of violence and a flip tweet having a go at a kind of overrated magic grandpa. But it's, I think it's more than that, though. It's, it's the act of criminalisation of your political opponents. Uh, and, I mean, you making, making that comment... <laughs> I mean, definitely, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, and but you're not irresponsible like me. <laughs> yeah, but people need to be irresponsible. We need, you know, we need to have people sort of saying that type of thing on Twitter. You know, yeah. just, you know, because it's, it's life on Twitter, isn't yeah. it? Uh, it's banter, in it. And and it's and this is you know picking up any excuse really to to target your political opponents. And um, I mean, that's one aspect of you know writing the book and preparing it and realizing that actually this stuff is a lot more serious than a lot of people take it for. You know, that's where yes. it's going. It's, and it's very easy to laugh at this stuff because it is ridiculous. But these people are actually winning. You know, the police are investigating the likes of you for saying comments like that. I'm so glad you said that. It's something that I have trouble explaining, even to Breitbart, even to The Spectator who ought to be about the two organisations most capable of articulating these, these problems. But I, d- I don't sense that they get why this is the, the primal um, problem of our times. I mean, this, is, this, is, this goes into the heart of everything, everything that we can... You know, never mind what's going on in politics. That's, that's kind of, that can be changed every, every four or five years. When you've got a situation where our private behaviour is being policed by these these new commissars, whatever you want to call them. I think That's, commissars is just the right word. It, it, yeah. It's very worrying. Mm. Much more serious than 
even than Brexit, actually. Definitely. Yeah. Brexit's just a manifestation, an yes. outward manifestation of this. Well, it's it's a it's an issue which, be, like all issues are nowadays, has been appropriated into the same sort of schema. Yeah. So we we've seen Remainers uh, take it that you know Brexiteers are unfavoured groups. You know they they don't just associate them with you know nasty English people, but with white people and also with with men. Even you say you see, you see even though. Um, you know, the, the stats show it's about half and half Brexit voters, yes. men and women. Um, progressives have gone on a, a large effort to politicise it as being an old white men sort of phenomenon. Yeah. So appropriating it into what I call the system of diversity, yeah. you know, which is how they see the world, how they relate to the world. So you can see sort of anything going on according to this sort of schema. Yeah. So it means you don't actually have to think about it. Do you think it's... Do you think it's a, a partly a product of, of the dumbing down of our education system that people have been, uh, and, and combined with the brainwashing people get at schools? Oh, do you think? I mean, is it that people are now just too thick to understand what's going on, or do you think it's people are too lazy to to to, to want to think things through properly and see what's going on? I think there's a bit of that, and I and I wouldn't sort of have a massive go at people for being lazy because you know we just are lazy and, and also yeah. most of us are just busy yeah you know we're you know having kids we're just too sort of busy doing life yeah to sort of get properly worked up and to properly you know think and understand it i mean i, I consider myself very lucky to have the time and i was full-time writing on this book to properly look at it and think about it and work through my ideas on it um because it, it Although, you know, the basis of it, of the, you know, favouring different groups is very straightforward. How it kind of works itself out in different ways is, is really, really complex. Mm. Um, so, like I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a go at people like that. And also, I mean, when, when I talk about it being a, like a system, yeah. it's, what I mean by that is, you know, is that there are, in our lives, um, it's convenient to go along with it. Yeah. It and, is. It, and it's it, it's and in that way it becomes habitual, you know. We're, we're used to getting approval, or you know, if we if we step outside of these ways, um, we know that we could come under attack. So we don't, a lot of us, and that's what I mean by becoming very systemic in society. Yes, I, I'm just just flicking through, through your book. There's so many examples in it, but here's one: Cambridgeshire Fire and Rescue Service. And their, their policy on employment is, they say, there is a historical and present need to diversify our workforce. The number of women operational staff has been under 5% and black and ethnic minority people are underrepresented in all parts of the service, operational and support. The proportion of staff who identify as gay is also negligible. Now, any rational person would say, so fucking what? If my house is burning down and I'm on the top floor... I don't care whether the person who rescued me is gay, whether they're black or white. I just want the best person for the job. And it's probably going to be male because he's probably going to be built mm. to rescue me from burning mm. buildings better yeah. than, than a woman. And yet here is the Cambridgeshire Fire and Rescue Service stating as a, as a kind of unimpeachable truth that everyone accepts um, there is a historical and present need to diversify our workforce. And there's another example you gave about the civil service, which has the same recruitment policy, that, that, that diversity is really important. I, I was quite staggered when I just went on the, the civil service website, I think something about you know their diversity policy, and I saw that they used the word progressive, progressive. that we are a progressive employer, which is a, an overtly political term. Yes. Term, sorry. Yes. Um, and that's under a conservative government as well. And that, that's just one of these indications of how deep this, this sort of politics has, has gone into the fabric of our society and our major institutions. And, and being spoken by people who really should know better. For example, Lord, is it Lord Kerr or Lord Carr? I don't know how to pronounce this. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce no. it. Yeah. But Lord Kerr, the civil servant, obviously a distinguished, a distinguished um, legal thinker who actually formulated Article 50, our exit route from the European Union. And he actually said this. I, it's, it's almost unbelievable that, that somebody can actually say this and not be embarrassed by it. He said, we native Brits are so bloody stupid 
that we need an injection of intelligent people, young people from outside, who come in and wake us up from time to time. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's racist. It's, it's, xenof- it's well, the opposite of xenophobic. It's, it's one of these comments. I mean, I, I think there is, you know, an aspect of flippancy to it, but it's, it's become so common this sort of thing. I mean, I, I used to say that type of thing, but not maybe to that extent. Um, you were trying to, you were trying to be used, I used side, to, right. you know, sort of go on about, oh, male, stone, and pay, all that, that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I, But I don't anymore because I've just realised how actually these things are meaningful. And, uh, and, if it, and if it is just a flippant remark that doesn't really have any consequence, well, it's sort of fine. I'm not, I'm not too bothered by it. But actually, no, this fits into a whole politics. That that is really what his politics are. Yes. Um, and you know, you know, this this aligns a lot with you know general establishment, um, which is both on the right and left sort of adv- adv- advocacy for large scale immigration. Yeah. Um, which on the left is pro diversity, and on on the right is um, pro you know economic expansion. Yeah. And those two tendencies are remarkably. Found a, a lot, of, a lot in common, which is why you get yeah. why you get in a uh, among extent. the remainers. You you get both. You look at George Osborne, the likes of him. You know, sort of he he fits in very much to that. You know, and is very comfortable in it. Yes, it, which is which is a very unlikely and slightly dangerous alliance between between the that chunk of the Labour Party, which is it, which is against against Brexit. And the the chunk of the the conservative establishment, which which wants wants the cheap the cheap labour, and they they accept each other's excuses. The, the 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 myth you talk about about how Britain is a nation of immigrants, which which it's not historically accurate. Not on that Again, scale. you know, when I used to hear this back in the day, I'd just think, oh, it's just harmless. It's kind of a nice thing to say, but actually, when you you realise how it's a serious, this is an element of, of real politics and of real propagation that you find all over in our society now, um, you know, from, from mainstream media. And it's just a basic untruth. You know, it's not even a complicated untruth. Yeah. And say so used to, you know, in respect of America, it makes a lot of sense. You know, America, to, you know, United States, to a large extent, is a nation of immigrants, you know, with a nod to the Native Americans. Yeah. Um, but here, it's it's t- it, politically it serves as you know like like a signal to people you know like you said earlier a dog whistle of I'm a member of the group and uh, we're all together in this. But um, so 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 the, the truth aspect is 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 entirely kind of skated over. They don't need that. They're, they're not interested in truth. It's about the narrative. Yeah, I mean like. Like I've said, it's in the book. I think it's not about lying. This it's just it's about telling a what is considered to be a more general truth, you know, kind of abstract truth, which is aligned again to the way history is going. So it all kind of the actual truth kind of just sort of melts into the air, as Marx like said, might say. You know. is, that, is that what Marx said? No, I kind of no. I'm paraphrasing right. Marx. I mean, he, he said um, he said something like that. Um, uh, to do. Sorry. No, no, don't worry. I just wanted to close because, unfortunately, I've got. I've got. A, I'd, I'd love love another half hour with you, but I've got a got a lunch date. But um, one thing your book helped me to understand is why Brexiteers get so much hatred from from snooty Remainers, because we've seen in surveys that that. Remainers are much more likely to say, "I would not like my daughter to marry a, a Brexiteer. I would not. Li- I would not like to break bread with it." They're much less intolerant. They're, they're much more intolerant than mm. than Brexiteers. I mean, I, I, I didn't give a toss. You know, I, I, I'd, I'd like my, to have Remainer friends. I don't want to. Yeah, have me risks. too. And like, you know, Remain is a particularly, you know, it's it's you know, it's a respectable political position. I, d- I don't have a problem with. But one thing you explain very well in your chapter on unfavoured groups is is how Brexit has been associated by Remain propaganda and in the Remain mindset with um, racism, xenophobia, anti-immigrant, a sort of rejection of the new, a rejection of progress. And so you suddenly understand 
why it is that Remainers look at people like me and they think, well, how could James Dellingpole stand up for this this world view, which is which is against pro progress, which is against against immigration, which is against everything that we we ought to be fighting for? And I think that's that's rather disturbing that they've got away with that. When you know the the the, the people in Sunderland say, or the people in working class communities around Britain. Uh, or indeed middle class communities, the, their motive for, for voting Brexit is far more honourable than the kind of pastiche version that's been dumped yeah. on them by, by it's, Remain. Again, it comes back to you know truth and honesty, doesn't it? And kind of reducing everything to a single sort of factor that we, that we can understand mm. and we can, we can deal with in the way we, we do politics. And, you know, the, the liberal left, as I talk about it, this is now the standard way of it doing politics. This is, this is its most comfortable position. I mean, you can see that. And one of the wonderful things that was terrible also about social media is we can see all this stuff going on in real time, day to day. Ah, yes. And how uh, matters of sort of trivial comments, people saying something apparently offensive, is what these people are most keen on, most interested in, most keen to jump on and attack, rather than dealing with other issues out there in the world. Yes. You know, um, and serious issues of, of which there are lots going on. And from the left left wing point of view, you would think after having uh, nine years of conservative government, you know, the left should maybe have a few things to say about what's gone wrong beyond... Uh, identity politics and calling people racist. Yes, indeed. So, by way of closing, what what is what's the solution? How do we deal with this? Uh, this is one thing. I mean, I, I I had my last chapter in trying to address it, and it's kind of it was. It, to be honest, it felt a lot like looking at the pyramids. You know, it's like. Well, how do we dismantle those? You know, how do you sort of even conceive of? I mean, not that you obviously want to dismantle the pyramids. Maybe it's it's a bad. Um, I, you know, I've climbed the, I've climbed the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Well, did um, you? Yeah, I, I I had to get up before dawn and sneak past the guards, and and they are big, big rocks. Big burly fellas. No, no, no. The the, the rocks that, that you have, mm. yeah you, that you have to climb up, and at the top you see graffiti put there by. Napoleonic, but by Napoleon soldiers. Of course, they it's were fantastic. there, weren't they? Yeah. And, and, you know, back in the day, they did do some really good graffiti, really good inscriptions. Mm. They, 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 they put serifs on the letters and stuff. It's, it's, it's great. Anyway, that's by the way. But I understand what you're saying. So, solutions. It's just, it's so, it's so big. It's like, where do you start? And, and I, I tried to address the, this in the book in terms of it must be to, to, to do with addressing institutions and you could you mentioned Gramsci earlier you know the march for institutions it's got to be something like the other way around but this stuff has taken decades for for them to do yes um, progressively and uh, and I, I don't see sort of any even the beginnings of a movement a political movement or otherwise to reverse any of this stuff um, so I mean, I, my, my favoured approach would be actually to, to set up institu new institutions for which you need money. You need people to fund new institutions which are, which are focused on doing proper work, valuing, you know, like we were talking about earlier, say if you're in the media, actually producing news which is trying to tell the truth, you know, just doing the basics or, you know, producing entertainment for entertainment's sake. Yeah, interesting uh, you say that. I, I, Look, I, I, I see that Netflix, to a degree, is doing that. I, I think Netflix is terrifying. But you've, just briefly, you've also got to nowadays, because you're always going to be under pressure, you've got to come up with a way of dealing with this stuff and resisting the pressure from the activists, because they're always on the case then now. Despite, despite Netflix being less awful than the BBC, are you aware of this rule that... Maybe you mentioned it in the book, actually. If you want to win a BAFTA award... You have to be compliant with the, yes, the BBC's the BA, ME, yes. ME thing. So it's really scary how the, the gangrene spreads. That even if you wanted to make a, a not woke film, if you wanted not to have token ethnic casting in it, in, in implausible roles and, 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 and a, a sort of transgender cameraman and stuff, the system 
is already working against you. At the, uh, you, if you, you you're not going to get an award. Well, in the, if you're not going to get an award, you may, you, may, you may not care about baubles, but then that means that you're less likely to get financing for future projects. You're Absolutely. Less likely to get to get yes. to get viewed. Yes. So it's very insidious. Yes, yeah, so, I mean it's it's a weird one because there is one element of just basic. There is some goodness in it. You know the fact that you know if you have a lot of. Uh, non-white people in the country and and women who are in the workplace who want to work in these areas it would be quite nice actually if they had you know they had some some part in well, making sure. films, if the, if the films and, that's, and that's fair enough I'm not going to cast I'm not going to yeah. cast um, but, Sean but, Bean as but the problem is this has become a, an organising principle hasn't it and yeah. it's gathered around this word representation so that the purpose of, of activity of work now is not actually the end product to produce, say, a really good film. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, that hopefully that's still in there, but a large part of it now, no, is, is to represent properly. And I don't think it is still in there. I, I think once you, once you cease to accept that the primary, indeed only duty of a, of a filmmaker is to make a film of quality, of artistic quality, be it in terms of its entertainment or in terms of its visual effects or whatever, then you have surrendered the past to, to this kind of relativism. Mm. The, the, yes. You, you, cannot have, you cannot have... And if there are no um, barriers towards what activists, you know, which is what they're looking to employ, if, if someone is meant to represent, say, you know, having a job in a film company, you're effectively employing, employing someone who's meant to be an activist, yes. who is meant to represent their group in a certain way, and, and how are they going to do that? They're going to do that by following the other political activists. Yes. Well, do, do you not and, think and it's... That, so that's going to... And if there are no... Um, how do you say? I don't know if barrier is, is really the word, but any sort of mitigating forces towards that sort of favouring that person. I mean, by, by nature, they're their view is going to prevail in the film, or at least have a, veto, have a veto yeah. on how the film goes. Is it not akin? I, this is just uh, uh, a thought that's just occurred to me. You've watched The Sopranos. You know how when there's a, when there's a, a new building project, that Tony Soprano makes sure that, one, that two or three of his men are employed mm. on the scheme. And they don't do any work. They're just there because that's, that's the way the system works, that you've got to have mafia people attached to the project to, in the same way, this is the function of... It's of very sad. I mean, I, 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 you make that, this sort of thing makes me angry. The way that that's... That's just the basic logic of it. Yeah. That's the way it's going. It's wrong. Yes. And we should call it out as wrong. And thank you, Ben, for... Ben Cobley, author of The Tribe, which I really recommend, for coming to talk to me about this in this cafe. And I'm sorry we can't talk for longer. Maybe another time. So thank you very much. You listen no, to thanks. Me. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, it's great. Mm. That, this was the Delling Pod with me, James Delling and my very special guest Ben Cobley. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.